ladies and gentlemen who have joined us on the virtual platform. Good morning. It is a, my pleasure to welcome you to this educational session, a key event in the recognition of Diabetes Month. The Diabetes Association of Jamaica has partnered with the Ministry of Health and Wellness in organizing the activities for the month. I am Patricia Ingram Martin, Chief Nurse in the Ministry of Health, and I will be guiding you through today's proceedings. Before we go further in the program, I will now pause to invite God's presence in our midst. I will now ask Ms. Angela Thomas to pray for us. Our Father, and our God, hallowed be thy name. We pause, O oh Lord, in this moment to offer thanks and praise to your glorious name. We thank you for life. Thanks for your abiding presence in this, our midst this morning. We thank you, Lord, for purposing this day, Lord, so that we can be gathered in this fashion, even as we have chosen this month to focus on diabetes. We pray, Lord God, that this effort will be blessed and that your Lord will continue to bless the partnership with the Diabetes Association on the Ministry of Health. We thank you, Lord, that you have provided for so many of us in so many ways. And so we pray a special blessing on this day's activity and all the activities for this month, that the efforts, Lord, will create a reach to those who are in need. And Lord, that this will affect them in a very positive way. As we seek, Lord, 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 as we seek to better the health of our nation, we pray that you'll guide and that you'll bless. Lord, even those who are grieving for the loss of loved ones, we pray, Lord, that you will comfort them as the water God of comfort. Bless us together this morning. And throughout this activity, again, we ask that your presence will guide and bless us together. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Miss Angela Thomas. Now we are ready to go into our activities. So just a quick overview as to why we are here. November is recognized worldwide as World Diabetes Month and World Diabetes Day is celebrated on November 14th. This year, the theme, Diabetes Nurses Make a Difference, is highlighting the role is highlighting the role nurses play in supporting and caring for persons living with diabetes. Diabetes is a serious chronic lifestyle disease affecting millions of people over the world and, con and continues to increase. Diabetes affects how your body turns food into energy. It is a disease in which your blood glucose or blood sugar levels are too high and glucose comes from the food you eat. Insulin is a hormone that helps the glucose get into your cells to give energy. Sometimes your body doesn't make enough or any at all doesn't make any insulin and so the, it doesn't use the insulin well. Glucose then stays in your blood and doesn't reach your cells. Over time, having too much glucose in your blood can cause complications. Example, um, matter, um, situations with the kidney, heart disease, and so on. Although diabetes has no cure, there are steps you can take to manage your diabetes and stay healthy. This panel discussion this morning is focused on the holistic management of diabetes mellitus from physical through to psycho psychological care to assist persons living with diabetes and their caregivers in improving and maintaining good health, particularly during this pandemic. Among our panel of experts it are persons in the areas of nursing, nutrition, physical activity, and mental health. And we have a very special person among us, someone with the experience of living with diabetes. 
The Honorable Minister, Dr. Christopher Tufton, will also be participating in the discussion. I will now invite Dr. The Honorable Errol Morrison, Life President of the Diabetes Association of Jamaica, to bring greetings. Thank you, Nurse Pat. It's good to be here. It's great to be partnering with the Ministry of Health and Wellness. And before I begin, I just want to say how pleased I am with the way in which I follow minister all over the country in several places, all at the same time. And I must tell you participants, his act is a classic example of cloning at work. And I want to congratulate him on the dynamic leadership he has been carrying on for the ministry at this time of the pandemic and being able to make a presence in so many issues which come at him you know, from every angle. It is a hard act to follow. It reminds me of when I was young. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, why are we here? Why, what are we celebrating? And I think we need to just pause because so much of what we achieve, we sometimes forget that we're standing on the shoulders of those who have gone before. And uh, the very realis realism of a diabetes month and a diabetes day is a recognition of that team nearly a hundred years ago that discovered that life-giving substance in the body, insulin, whose introduction into the management of diabetes wiped away that rapid death with which this condition was so associated. And so we celebrate the leader of that team, Sir Frederick Banting, his birthday being that of the 14th of November. And I think it's a world you know, celebration that has been you know, so, so, so present over these several years since the celebration has been introduced. But also, as one who has been working with the chronic disease team in particular with diabetes over the years, I have sat and quietly and sometimes noisily acknowledged the tremendous work of our nursing colleagues because what affects some of the quality of advice and management that we offer is that patient doctor gap. And we call it the white coat syndrome where we're not usually able to get the truth or the full details of what is affecting that patient. And I tell you, if you want to know what's happening, ask nurse. Because nurse has always had that connectiveness, that connectivity, you know, with patient care. And so I think in celebrating the nurse this year, it is only so apt. And I wish to give them my own congratulations. And if minister will allow me, I want to extend a glass of spirit <laughs> to celebrate their contribution. And finally, I just think that this kind of webinar is a, is a, is a very important contribution at this time. The pandemic is keeping our diabetics at home. It is keeping them out of getting out there, not only being physically active, but also getting access to their healthcare and so on. We at the Diabetes Association have been particularly concerned. And we think that since we cannot get Mohammed to the mountain, we want to take the mountain to Mohammed. And it is in that sense that we are communicating, discussing and working with the Ministry of Health and the National Health Foundation to reach out and get our teams out there to help to reach those individuals who are shut in in a sense or who are staying in trying to avoid the exposure to the COVID. And it is in that context then that this year, the pandemic year, this webinar has a particularly important contribution in the lives of diabetes and diabetic persons, you know, worldwide. And I want to congratulate the ministry again in joining with us, in reaching out in this awareness 
and all the various parameters that are being discussed and, 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 and uh, celebrated today. So, so much then for my little input and I stand by to listen and to learn and to offer any kind of contribution as the day goes by. Thanks again for joining with us and we look forward to a tremendous day. Thank you very much, Prof, for your kind words of greetings that you have brought on behalf of the Diabetes Association of Jamaica. And we are really appreciative that you will be staying with us so you could assist us as a resource person further on in the question and answer segment. Thank, thank you again, Prof. I will now invite Dr. the Honorable Christopher Tufton, Minister of Health and Wellness, to address us, after which he will segue into the discussion uh, section where he will be chairing. Minister. It's on. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Master of Ceremonies, uh, Ms. Patricia Ingram Martin, and I'll remove my mask and reassure you that there is sufficient physical distancing, right? So Madam Master of Ceremonies, our Chief Nursing Officer, the Ministry of Health and Wellness, uh, Professor Errol Morrison, Honorary Life President and Medical Director, the Diabetes Association of Jamaica. Thank you, sir, for those kind words earlier. And of course, for all you do uh, in public health, but in this instance for the response to diabetes, a very common condition here in the population. Uh, let me just rec recognize also other panelists and distinguished guests who are here. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the media, um, good morning to you all. I am pleased to join in the recognition and of, of Diabetes Awareness Month by the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Along with our agency, the National Health Fund, and our partners, the Pan American Health Organization and the Diabetes Association of Jamaica, and also the Heart Foundation of, of Jamaica. Diabetes Awareness is being commemorated this month with World Diabetes Day on November 14th 2020 under the theme the nurse and diabetes this was said earlier highlighting however the role nurses play in supporting and caring for persons living with diabetes it would appear that the theme selected was in keeping with the world health organization's designation of 2020 and this is very appropriate as the international year of the nurse and the midwife Globally, this recognition is so relevant in that the World Health Organization tells us that some 422 million people have diabetes, the majority of whom are from low and middle income countries, such as our own here in Jamaica, while 1.6 million deaths are directly attributed to the disease. In Jamaica, the data tells its own story. The 2016-2017 Jamaica Health and Lifestyle Survey reveals that one in every eight Jamaicans 15 years and older have diabetes, yet four out of every 10 individuals with the disease are unaware that they have it. Some 92.5% of Jamaicans 15 years and older with the disease are on treatment but only 27.5% are controlled, which, which is clearly a worrying statistic. As we turn the spotlight on diabetes this November, we must acknowledge the scale of the problem of non-communicable diseases facing us and redouble our efforts to solve it, drawing on all our resources, including our nurses who are essential, not only as healthcare providers, but also as professionals on whom we can rely for the promotion of self-care management among patients. The Ministry will be championing the cause of persons living with diabetes. We have updated our clinical management guidelines 
which is now available on our website, and we will be working on increasing access to testing through the introduction of point-of-care testing. This methodology of testing is the gold standard for monitoring and control of diabetes. Our agency, the National Health Fund, will continue to support persons through the provision of diabetic medication and supplies, and I encourage persons with diabetes to enroll in, this, in, in the NHF card program to access this, this benefit. We encourage stakeholders, from persons living with diabetes to their family and friends and others involved in their care management, to join our nurses in the effort to ensure the best possible health outcome for persons with diabetes and to, as far as possible, engage in behaviors to reduce the incidence of diabetes and other NCDs. Very, very important because it is through lifestyle that we manage the risk of, 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 of diabetes. Those behaviors include increased physical activity, a healthy diet, routine health checks, and strict medi uh, adherence to medication. Again, we thank our partners for working with the Ministry of, to raise awareness regarding early screening and control of diabetes in our population. This month, we will continue to raise this awareness through the various planned activities, including two community interventions in Troja District, St. Catherine and Pembroke Hall, St. Andrew, training of healthcare workers in the clinical management of diabetes, launching the public-private partnership for NCD care, diabetes and hypertension, as well as sharing health education messages through traditional and social media. I think this is quite important. Only yesterday I was speaking to a, uh, the, the group at the ministry dealing with the NCD response and assessing COVID in the context of our non-communicable disease health profile. And you know, we concluded, I certainly concluded, that the real response to COVID is to ensure that our health profile as a population um, is of such where we minimize the risks of NCDs because those who have been impacted by NCDs are the ones who are most vulnerable to COVID. And this is something that you will see as part of the narrative going forward in public health. So today we kickstart the month long activities with our panel discussion, which is focused on the holistic management of diabetes from physical through to psychological care. And the aim is to assist persons living with diabetes and their caregivers in improving and maintaining good health, particularly during this pandemic. We encourage all to listen, to attempt to understand, and to participate, and particularly those who have been so affected or who are classified as vulnerable to be so affected. Uh, I want to just use the opportunity since I'm at the podium to uh, uh, recognize the panelists and then we will bring them in uh, as uh, after. So I'm pleased to join, be joined, of course. We are all pleased by the experts in the care of management of persons living with diabetes who are on location or on Zoom. So we will get from each speaker approximately five minutes presentation. We're going to ask them to try to stick to the five-minute um, uh, designated time. The first is Bishop Solomon Forbes, an individual who is living with diabetes. Bishop Forbes has been living with diabetes for four years, a committed minister of religion who served in the Jamaica Defense Force. He's a chaplain for the Olympic Gardens Police Station and is a facilitator for the Ministry of Justice. And Mr. Forbes, or Bishop Forbes, will share his experience living with diabetes, important testimonial. Then we will have Ms. Andrea Hunt, diabetes nurse educator. Ms. Hunt is a certified diabetes educator, corporate education program facilitator in Broward County, Florida. Uh, Ms. Hunt is a diabetes education consultant who provides diabetes education programs to healthcare professionals in the Caribbean. And she will share with us guidelines to empower persons living with diabetes, which will include foot care. Then our third speaker, again five minutes, will be Ms. Sabrina Palomino, who is a nutritionist 
And Ms. Palomino is a registered nutritionist with 13 years experience, currently employed at the Southern Regional Health Authority as a primary care officer, uh, duties including advising persons with diabetes as well as other patients about best practices in maintaining a healthy diet. And she will address nutrition for persons living with diabetes. Our fourth speaker will be Ms. Charmaine Plummer, and she sits directly to my left. And Charmaine, very aptly wearing a sneakers and a Jamaica Move shirt, ready to work out. Uh, Ms. Charmaine Plummer is a senior health education officer in the Health Promotion and Education Unit here at the Ministry of Health and Wellness. She has over 28 years of experience. Don't mind her looking, you know, she looks like she's 28, but in exercise science and is the coordinator of the national focal point for physical wellness she will be discussing physical wellness activities for persons living with diabetes and then we have a fifth speaker again for five minutes dr kevin goldburn who is to my further uh, left in the yellow shirt next to chief nurse and Dr. Goldburn will speak on mental health. He's a director of mental health and substance abuse services in the Ministry of Health and Wellness with over 20 years experience in psychiatry, serving as a regional psychiatrist in the Western Region Health Authority and was consultant psychiatrist at the Bellevue Hospital, as well as medical director of, of the medical services branch in the Jamaica Constabulary Force. So we will have five speakers at five minutes each, which you do the math, it will hopefully go through quickly, but focused on sufficiently on the important elements of diabetes and the treatment, uh, whether for prevention or for control. And at that point, we will then open the floor for further discussion. Thank you very much. And let us look forward to the presentation and participation. Good morning, panelists. My name is Bishop Solomon Forbes. I serve in the Jamaica Defense Force. I'm now a member of the Ministry of Justice, serving as a facilitator. I'm a minister of religion. In the year, let me just say good morning to the minister and all the panelists. In the year 2016, I was diagnosed to have diabetes. I did not know the implications or anything about it at that time. However, I went to clinics, the Olympic Gardens clinics and other clinics, and nothing seems to be working. At one stage, my sugar level was in the 30s. When somebody introduced me to the Diabetics Association and I came up here, the day the doctor saw me, Dr. Prasad, he was surprised and he was saying I should either be dead or at the least in a coma. The nurse, um, Nurse Knight, was instructed by him and he gave me an injection. She, followed up by alone asking my wife not to let me sleep because I was so weak. I was like dropping down and she insisted. She stood by and asked my wife to keep me up. While I was there after the injection, she did another test and then she went back into the doctor about 30 or so minutes after and the doctor came out again, did another test with me and then he gave me some prescription and sent me home. I have been living with this um, condition for a while. At one stage, I was in Pampas pastors from our denomination began to write me off that I was going to die. I was on pampas and I was sleeping on a on, on blanket. I could not hold nothing. Anything was just coming out, urine and feces. Everything just gushed out and everybody thought I would not have made it. Going to Diabetics Association, I keep in touch with them and they call me and Nurse Knight has been instrumental in ensuring that I get my medication on time and that I keep the and the protocols that I need to do in order to control this, this disease. Today, I can testify that this morning, my sugar level was 5.3. Yesterday, it was 4.6. And it's all because of the influence that the nurses at the Diabetics Association and the doctors has put into me and my interest in wanting to get this thing done. At one stage, I love um, potato, Irish potato. And um, I was like eating Irish potato like it was going at a style, not knowing that this thing was also a killer. And then doctor realized it was that and he stopped me and praise the Lord, today I'm good. 
I can function. At one stage, I, I, was, I was stopped from driving. Now I can drive since that I bought vehicles and driving and working, going up and down. And like Minister Tufton have just said, I stay in Mace mainly because of this pandemic that's going on in our country, in our land. But I am good and well. I still function as a facilitator at the Ministry of Justice. I work at the Tower Hill Center and it has been good. So I give all the praise and my hats off to all the nurses, especially that works at the Diabetes Association, because they have been very influential in helping me to keep my sugar under control. Also, I want to give thanks to Dr. Prasad because he took time out. I can call him, I can call him anytime and they would give me directive as to what to do or what is going on. Today, I am very blessed and I give God thanks. God bless you all. Do have a wonderful day. Amen. Thank you very much, uh, Bishop Forbes, and your testimony does uh, explain the serious nature of diabetes, but also provides hope that with treatment and with adherence to the treatment, one can lead a normal life. So that's a very good testimonial. Thank you very much. And you ended with the importance of the nurses at the Diabetes Association and uh, so it's quite appropriate now to invite uh, Nurse Hunt, diabetes nurse educator, to now come in and give her presentation. Thank you, Minister, and thank you, everyone. Good morning, and a blessed Diabetes Month to everyone. Uh, special greetings today to the nurses, because we are indeed part of the core of the management team. I have been tasked to discuss diabetes and I was told I had 10 minutes minister, so I'm going to try my very best. I preface my topic diabetes in a nutshell. And the first thing I want to address, you have mentioned before, is that diabetes is one of the four major non-communicable diseases. And that in Jamaica, the prevalence for those over 15 years, according to the last lifestyle survey, was 12% of people with diabetes and another 12% with pre-diabetes, which is almost 25% of the population. Interesting information. So the next question is how can diabetes be diagnosed? And people always want to know that. I have listed here four options for a, a provider to test diabetes and one of them is just the blood sugar finger stick but it has to be repeated twice and it could be fasting or it could be a random reading. The second way to test is to use an oral glucose tolerance test and the final way is to use a hemoglobin A1c. So when you find out that you have diabetes what then are the signs and symptoms of diabetes and you see them there. You get very fatigued, you may urinate frequently, you may have excessive thirst, you may have excessive hunger, blurred vision, numbness or tingling in your hands and feet, sudden weight loss, or sexual problems. And indeed, we find that people who complain of all these symptoms, they probably have had diabetes for quite some time before this actual diagnosis. So what are the types of diabetes? How do we classify them? In Jamaica, 10% of the population approximately have type one diabetes, which is indeed a different kind of diabetes. It is an autoimmune disease. The body has destroyed the cells that make insulin. And the reference was made to the importance of insulin before. Here we're saying that this patient no longer makes insulin. So you have to inject insulin for life. So that's type one. Type two, which is 90% of the population and most of the people you will meet are people who either make insufficient amounts of insulin or have what is called insulin resistance. And the third dysfunction that we are now aware of is that their liver puts out excess sugar. So that makes the circulating sugar higher than it should be and it's called hyperglycemia. The third class of diabetes occurs during pregnancy. It's called gestational diabetes, and it is related to the hormones of pregnancy and the insulin resistance that these hormones preclude in the body. 
And the final type we call other. It's related to medications that may raise your sugar, chemotherapy, steroids, that kind of thing. However, we're focusing on type two because as I said, that's 90% of the population. So what are the risk factors? I've listed some of them here. Age, the older you get, the more likely you are to be at risk for diabetes. Obesity, which has become a global pandemic. Inactivity, which has contributed to the obesity. Lifestyle choices, the amount of food, the type of food. History of diabetes in your family, your parents, your brother, your sister. Blood pressure or cholesterol issues. All of these are part of this dysfunction that contributes to type two diabetes. And of course, smoking. And if a woman has had a large baby during pregnancy, we monitor her for that. So having said that now, how do we manage diabetes? The person with diabetes should really have a, an opportunity to sit down with a trained clinician who has been is, is able to help them to understand the concepts of diabetes self-management education and support. There are four core areas the patient must begin to understand. How and when to take medication. That's the first one. If you take insulin, then you need to know how does your insulin work and how do you eat in relation to the insulin. Then there are the people who have type two diabetes, which commonly start off with education on activity and just health and nutrition. And then we add one of five classes of oral agents until we help the patient to gain that target like the pastor mentioned. So that is the ultimate goal. Some people with type two require insulin too. They still have type two, but they require insulin. And then we teach them how to make food, how to eat food. And the, Ms. Palomino, who, is, who has been in one of my classes, is going to take that area. But this, the concept is which foods make the blood sugar go up and how much can I have? So I leave it to her. The, the third concept is increasing your activity safely. Safely meaning if you have complications, how much can you do? Did your doctor give you permission? How long can you walk if you're going to walk? Things like that. And finally, testing the blood sugar. And I am very aware that the Ministry of Health has partnered, of course, with the NHF. And people have access now to machines. We want them to use them and use them to test their glucoses test them, document the numbers, and bring them back because there are targets that we want to see the patients achieve for optimal control. So what are the goals of diabetes education? We want the patient to achieve these targets, like I said before. Also, we think of things like target blood pressure. Is your weight healthy or do you need to lose a little weight? And most importantly, how do you feel? What is your quality of life? All of this is what we focus on. The patients need to feel that they have achieved something. They're feeling better about themselves and about their lives. So the next one I want to touch on is the standards of care. And the first item I wrote there is daily foot care. And I put two asterisks because I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. But there are also standards that encourage you to use the numbers that we give you as targets to, to guide you. Also, when you get your lab work done, what is your hemoglobin A1C? The target should be 7% or less. Keep that number in your mind. We also encourage patients with diabetes to get annual eye exams to check for eye damage with an ophthalmologist, to get re regular dental checks, to get annual lab work to see what is their cholesterol, how is their kidney functioning, to get urine tests, to get blood pressure tests, to lose weight, if needed. And finally, to talk about problem solving. If I wake up this morning sick, what's wrong? What can I do if I have a very high glucose? Do I have a plan? And that's called sick day guidelines. And then finally, with every disease, one needs to learn to handle stress and to cope with life. We're all faced with a pandemic now. But in addition to the pandemic, there are so many other things going on around us, such as financial needs and 
the stress of working or not working, money, children, et cetera, et cetera. So let me go back to the foot care a little bit because that is a core area. Diabetes damages the feet, the kidney, and the eyes at first, and then eventually we also find it can cause coronary vascular disease too. But for foot care, the person with diabetes every day, you wash your feet, wash them properly. Dry your feet, dry between the toes. Moisturize your feet, but do not put moisturizer between the toes. Make sure that you wear cotton socks, right? If you're going to have your toes cut, cut by somebody trained who knows how to cut them. Examine your feet every day. Do not wear, walk barefoot. Please, please, please do not walk barefooted because if you injure or cause trauma to the feet, you may not feel it because your diabetes has damaged the nerves to the feet. And finally, when you buy shoes, buy shoes that are comfortable and that you can wear without causing blisters or trauma to the feet. So daily foot care is a personal decision that patients need to take charge of. So what is the role of the diabetes educator? The diabetes nurse educator is a trained clinician who facilitates care of the patient by first of all, completing a, an assessment. They help the patient to develop a plan of care between them, a collaborative agreement, how to optimize control. They teach the disease concepts that I mentioned before. They provide ongoing support and education as needed and they collaborate with the physician on the patient's behalf. And all of this as a nurse, we know we're nurse advocates, we're collaborators, we're teachers, we do assessment and documentation. So this is just an expansion of the role of the nurse as we know it. So finally, your diabetes care then becomes a team effort. And as you can see from this diagram, it involves a nurse, a doctor, a dietitian, a psychologist, a pharmacist, a podiatrist, an ophthalmologist, and I omitted the nephrologist, and that is my own mea culpa, sorry. So everybody is part of your team, and who benefits? The patient benefits from this intervention. So we hope that you are aware that you are part of our team. Finally, preventing complications of diabetes. Know your risk factors. Know what conditions you have. If you're obese, if you have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, if you have a family history, and then know what complications you are at risk for. What can I do to prevent them? Now we have research that shows that I can prevent the eye damage, the, the kidney damage, the foot damage, and the um, amputations by just keeping my blood glucoses under control and taking care of myself. So I don't think I made it in five minutes, but I'm sharing one of my orchids, which is my other love to tell you, God bless you all, a happy diabetes month. And maybe, may, just maybe we can all work as a team. I have worked in Jamaica before and I'm always willing to help because our people are our, our prize. Thank you so much and God bless everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nurse Hunt. You've, you've well, well deserved extra time. Um, I'm sure you have really provided uh, a lot of information to, to those who are listening and those in this room. So we really appreciate it. We trust you are keeping safe too in that faraway land. Um, and we know your heart continues to reside here in Jamaica. So thanks for that. And the discussion will continue. Um, so at this time, I'm going to ask our third presenter, uh, Ms. Palomino, our nutritionist, to help us. And I'm, I'll be paying keen attention to this because I, I, I need advice from a nutritionist, although I'm not diabetic, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, hopefully not. <laughs> uh, to give us her presentation as it relates to nutrition and diabetes. Um, Ms. Palomino. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sabrina Palomino. I'm a nutritionist. And this morning, I'll be speaking to you about nutrition and diabetes. Now, usually, when a person is diagnosed with diabetes, the first thing they, want, they worry about is, what am I going to eat? What is my diet? What is my diabetic diet? Now, the first thing that we want persons to know that there is no such thing as a diabetic diet. 
We don't want you to think that because you're diagnosed with diabetes, you have to omit certain things. You have to be on a strict diet. And as most of my patients will say, when they hear the word diet, they think a little bit of food and they're not up to that, right? So what we want you to understand is that there's no such thing as a diabetic diet. A person that is diagnosed with diabetes should eat the same foods as their family eats. But what we want them to do is to watch the amount that they eat and the timing of their meals. So your portions, the amount that you eat is very, very important as well as the timing of your meals. Now, most persons are concerned that it is an extra expense to the pocket and given the financial situation that we might be facing right now, we want them to know that it's not an extra expense. It's what you have in your home and then with the guide of the nutritionist or the dietitian, they can help you to understand how much it is that you should eat given what you have at home. Now, the, what we do recommend is that persons eat at least three balanced meals per day and small snacks. And what we mean when we say snacks, we're not talking about the conventional ones in the little bags or packs like that. Snacks usually mean smaller, more nourishing meals, which we usually recommend that it be your fruits, your vegetables, or you can also use your nuts. Each meal or snack should contain protein because we need it to be balanced as well. What I notice traditionally with our population, how we eat is very, very important because what we realize, if for, for example, for breakfast, so most Jamaicans, they'll have, say, bread and rye planting with a cup of tea. And when you look at that, that is just a, a meal of carbohydrates and there's no protein or any other macronutrient that is important to them. So how we eat is important. Each meal should contain at least your protein and your fat. And we also want them to select a variety of foods from all the food groups. And if you look to your right of the presentation, you see what is known as our food-based dietary guideline. And this is a guide that will guide them as in how much to eat from each food group. And we also want you to watch your portion sizes. And with the food-based dietary guidelines, we can guide you with that booklet about what amount of each food that you should eat. Now, this is the food-based dietary guideline. It has eight recommendations. The first seven speaks to nutrition. And what we encourage you to do is to eat a variety of foods from all the food groups. So all foods from all the food groups is very, very important because every food gives your body different nutrients and the body needs different nutrients for different functions. So we do encourage that you eat a variety. Also to eat a variety of foods daily from your food groups. Now with your fruits, we know they're naturally high in sugars. So there is some recommendations about the amount of fruits that you should eat per day. We usually say two to three servings. We want you to include a variety of vegetables daily. And that includes both what we call starchy and non-starchy vegetables. We also want you to include more peas, beans, and nuts in your daily meals, reduce your intake of salty and processed foods, and to reduce your intake of fats and oils and that of sugary foods and drinks. Ms. Plummer will expand and speak to more about making physical activity a part of your daily routine. Now, most persons with diabetes, their main concern is that of our staple foods or what we call our starchy foods in Jamaica or our carbohydrate. We do need these foods. They're very, very important in the diet. As was explained earlier in the introduction, is that your body convert these foods to glucose and your body cannot work without glucose. So how much of these foods you eat is very, very important. What we do recommend is that with this food group, you aim for whole grains. You aim for foods that have high sources of fiber, such as your whole wheat bread, whole grain rice, flour, more of your ground provisions. They will give you fiber, right? And that will slow down the rate at which your body breaks down the food so you won't have a rapid increase in your blood sugar levels versus if you eat foods that are low in these added fibers. Now, other food groups do have starch or carbohydrate in them. It's not just our staple foods, right? We do have our fruits and our vegetables and our legumes. Those are other food groups that do have carbohydrates in them or what we call starch. Right, so what we do recommend for these food groups is that, as I said before, increase your fiber intake. So when it comes to your fruits, think more whole fruits than your fruit juices, because your fruit juices will have high added sugar in them, while your fruit will not have that added sugar, and you'll also get the benefits of fiber. We, as I said before, we want you to choose whole grains, breads, and cereals, eat a lot of vegetables, 
And most importantly, we want you also to read your food labels because we're in the convention, conventional age now where everything is basically packaged. So you reading your food labels is very, very important. Now, two other food groups that are very important to, to make your diet as balanced as possible is that of your food from animals and your fats and oils. Now, these have to be a part of the diet. So as I said earlier, we recommend that each time you have a meal, you should have a carbohydrate, should have a protein that can come from your food from animals, food group, as well as your legumes and nuts, and also to have a little fats and oils in the diet because variety is important, all nutrients are important in the diet. But what we do recommend is that with living with diabetes is that you try to reduce your overall fat intake and you can do so by reducing your frying of foods and more so do your baking, broiling, grilling and roasting of your foods. Now, this is the end of my presentation. What I want you to take away from it is that there's no such thing as a diabetic diet, but it's all about how much I eat, the timing of my meals. So it's your portion sizes is what is important. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Palomino. Um, I learned a little there. I just need to try and remember all of those food groups. Um, but thanks for that contribution. Uh, I'm hoping that these presentations will be mounted on the website of the Ministry of Health and Wellness. I'm going to ask you to do that. So to our listeners, please um, feel free to visit the sites, the site, our site, and I'm sure the Diabetic Association also has a site. So just for information purposes. All right. At this point, we're going to have the lady who has been in this for 28 years, who looks 25, and I'm attributing her looks to the fact that she's a physical activity lady. Uh, Ms. Plummer, your time now to tell us exactly what and how your area of focus contributes to controlling diabetes. Good morning. Thank you, Minister. I am very excited to be here. And if you're sitting down, I'm going to ask you to stand with me. And if you can't stand, I'm just going to ask you to shrug your shoulders up and down because we're going to be talking about movement, very, very important as it relates to the management and care of diabetes and for healthy lifestyle in general. So today I want to show you how important movement is. The donut, hamburger, sure, they're all pretty bad for you, but most people know that and at least try to limit their intake somewhat to these items, even a little bit. But it's the things we don't think about that can really cause damage. Things we use every day so regularly we don't even think about how its constant use could actually be killing us. The real culprit is the chair. We were given legs for a reason. Most third world cultures don't even have chairs and they walk an average of 10 miles a day. We in the modern world, on the other hand, spend most of our entire waking day sitting down. People go right from bed to sitting on the toilet, after which they sit at the breakfast table, then they sit in the car as they drive to work and spend the entire day sitting at a desk, only getting up to sit in the toilet and in the cafeteria. Then they sit in the car to drive and sit at the local bar for happy hour. Then when they've had enough of that, they go drive home and spend the rest of the day sitting in a comfortable chair watching TV before they crawl to bed to recover from all the physical exertion that day. When, when people go out, they sit at a restaurant or a movie theater. Sitting all day is far worse for you than you might think. So you see, sitting is very, very dangerous. So I'm going to share some of the benefits of movement. So keep shoving your shoulders or twinkling your toes or your fingers. Lower your risk of circulatory disease by 35%. When you are active, the heat produced by your muscles increases your body temperature, making you feel warmer. Your heart starts to beat faster, pumping more blood to the muscles you are using. Your heart is also a muscle. If you are active regularly, it gets bigger and stronger. Your muscles are working harder, so they need more oxygen. You start to breathe faster so your blood can pick up more oxygen from your lungs. Your lungs work harder to make this happen. Once your blood has picked up oxygen, it moves to the muscles you are using, giving them the extra oxygen they need. If you are active regularly, more capillaries grow in the muscles you've been working. 
This is one reason why activity starts to feel easier over time. Getting active is great for people with diabetes. If you have type 2 diabetes, you have too much glucose in your blood, probably because you don't have enough insulin. Physical activity helps you use the insulin you do have. It also helps your cells use glucose, even when there is no insulin. Regular physical activity can improve your memory and attention span. Over time, the bit of the brain involved in memory and learning seems to get bigger. Long-term physical activity leads to a lower resting heart rate and lower blood pressure. This helps cut your risk of heart and circulatory disease. And there are more reasons to smile. When you're active, your brain produces chemicals called endorphins. These reduce feelings of pain and make you feel more positive. Getting active cuts down on stress hormones, reducing anxiety. Combine activity with a balanced diet and you'll help... So... That's just a small percent of the benefits that we can get from physical activity. So we want to ensure that we are being physically active every day. Remember, we have a small mouth, some large arms, and our legs, they're very large. So they're here to move. That's a machine. So we need to eat less, move more, right? So all those benefits that we talked about, we are going to make sure that we do physical activity to ensure we get those benefits. For children, the recommendation is at least 60 minutes, five days a week of moderate to vigorous activity, and it must be a combination of muscle and bone strengthening activity. That's the recommendation for our children. For adults, it's at least 30 minutes, five days a week to get some health benefit, meaning increased circulation, reduce stress. But if we want to lose weight, we must do at least 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous. And if we want to lose and maintain, it's at least 90 minutes. The more weight we have, more work we'll have to do. So we need you to start now. No matter where you are, move those legs. Let's keep those machines moving. And for the elderly, it's at least 30 minutes, five days a week. So we need to move, move, move. We are dying because we are sitting. And for the persons who are diabetic, you need to move so that we can, you know, get those blood flowing and reduce the sugar or glucose in the blood. So now, show you some benefits. If you are a diabetic patient, these are some of the activities that are very good for you. Swimming, jogging, dancing, these activities, they're not very vigorous. You know, you maintain them at a low to moderate pace, and it's, it's a very effective way of managing and controlling your blood glucose or your blood sugar. And it is very important if you are going to start a physical activity program that you check with your doctor before you start because if you have a condition if you're diabetic hypertensive you have any other medical condition your doctor will determine the intensity level the type of activities that you can do and then now you can go to the personal trainer the physiotherapist or the PE teacher and they will give you the type of activities and the intensity level and work with you so you can get maximum benefit. Physical activity is free. You don't need to go to the gym. Remember, we have the machine. And if you follow your doctor's advice and your personal trainer, you have nothing to worry about. No side effect once you follow that prescription. We have been working with the nurses and the doctors and all healthcare workers to ensure that we train them in what we call exercise prescription to prescribe physical activity for persons with special condition or your fitness level or age appropriate physical activity. So make sure that you check with your health personnel, your doctor, your nurses, so that you can start your program. And we want you not to hurt yourself. So once you start doing something that you love to do and you're enjoying it and you're seeing the benefits, whether short term, long term, then you make it a part of your lifestyle. Every day you move. And as you heard before, you will see how the muscles get stronger and stronger and it becomes easier over a period of time because it's a lifetime. God gave us a movement because he knew that this day was going to come and we're going to be sitting down and stuff like that. We call it KFC, Burger King, Jaguar, Benz, Toyota. Come and tell us to sit, take our monies, and we die and we suffer the consequence. So let's move those arms and legs. If you have one leg, move it. If you have one arm, move it. No matter what you have, as long as we have life, we're going to move it so you have no excuse. As it says, motivate your mind and the body will follow. I guarantee you, 
more movements, more memories, more life. If you want to have that, just start moving a little bit more and you'll be surprised. Thank you very much. Well, the only thing that you put up there that I can't do is dance. But I probably can try and manage the rest of them. How is that? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Plummer, for this very important aspect to controlling diabetes. And so we're getting the full picture, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the only other issue which I know is related to all of the issues mentioned before is our mental health. And uh, very appropriately, we have now Dr. Goldburn to address us for his in his five minutes on the mental health and the coping mechanisms to deal with diabetes or control diabetes. Thank you, Minister. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. And it's important for us to realize that Person living with diabetes, mellitus, have multiple psychosocial issues related to diabetes management and its complications even before COVID. And there's an entity called diabetic distress, which refers to the negative emotions, such as feeling hopeless, angry, or frustrated that persons who are dying with diabetes experience, especially if they lack social support. I remember a patient I had who was about 28 years old, a male. He had a healthy lifestyle, and he came to me. Why? Because he was emotionally distressed. How is it that he diagnosed with diabetes and led to a healthy lifestyle? So this diabetic distress can actually lead to persons not to undertake the proper self-care, attend to the physician visit time, and hence will have a poor outcome in their blood glucose control. And now COVID-19 has made matters worse with the fact that there is not only restriction in movements, but there's also the fear that if they contract the disease, they may have severe COVID-related complications, and this may even include death. Additionally, we should realize that psychological illnesses such as depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorders are increased in pandemics, particularly with chronic diseases such as diabetes, HIV, and tuberculosis not to mention the stigmatization occurs in these conditions. Also, it should be noted that chronic stress and psychiatric disorders increase due to the risk of a person becoming obese under, under this chronic stress or due to psychiatric disorders, and then they have a risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Plus, of course, with COVID restriction, they may have decreased activity and unhealthy eating snacking a lot on comfort food and also become obese as a result. So clearly there's a link between COVID-19, diabetes mellitus, and mental illness, which must be emphasized. Also, one should recognize that there are coexistence between diabetes and psychological illnesses. It ranges from 20 to 50 percent. And depression in particular, some report, report 30 percent of patients who have diabetes mellitus also have depression. And it's important that we do have important tips to pass on to both patients, their families, and healthcare workers. First one I would mention is credible risk information. Because a lot of persons really have a lot of fear because they have been feeding on what they see on social media. A lot of, a lot of times there are rumors, incorrect information. And we encourage credible risk information being exposed to, whether it's from World Health Organization, of a measure of health. Then there's a the need for social connection. Yes, we encourage physical distance, but we want to encourage social closeness to both families, to friends, to other peers who may be diabetic, who we might have to try to meet in innovative ways, whether it's by WhatsApp group or other means, and also the healthcare provider. It's also important that diabetic patients keep well ensuring that they do not have to end up being sick and having to be hospitalized by ensuring they do the self-care in monitoring blood glucose at home, exercise regularly, even if maybe in a confined space, and also adhering to the dietary guidelines. In order to get over the boredom and the stress of the confinement, a regular routine is recommended. 
So I do have a very routine of what they do in the morning, what they do at midday, and what activity they participate in. As much as possible, it may demand of creativity. Then another point to emphasize to help diabetic patients cope at this time is screening and proactive support. I'm heartened to know that you have diabetic nursing educators because it's important that the medical staff be aware that there's an increased possibility of person with diabetes to become psychological distress, even for COVID and worsen by COVID. So medical staff have to also, in checking about physical control, about the diabetes and so on, must make inquiries about patient's emotional state. And you have two questions you can ask. One, have you been feeling sad or down almost daily for the past two weeks? Or two, have you felt that you've lost interest in previous enjoyable activities like watching TV, listening to music almost daily for the past two weeks? And the question for either one of these questions, or for both questions is yes, then it's likely that this person may be depressed and need further evaluation to assess if the person is depressed, you know, providing necessary support for the person and treatment with medication where necessary. It's also important to make sure patients are exposed to telemedicine and telecounseling where they can access to go to health clinics, they can at least get advice over the phone. And last but not least, I must mention we have the medical helpline, which is 888-639-5433, or simply remember 888-NEW-LIFE, which is a 24-hour, seven, day seven days per week, psychological support produced by psychologists. When you call this number, they can provide emotional support for you. If you are feeling any form of emotional distress, they can provide support for you. And where you need additional help, they will direct you to additional help. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Goldburn, uh, our uh, mental health specialist. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. We've had five presentations in addition to our chief nurse and um, earlier, um, we had my own presentation and Professor Morrison's presentation, all combined a, a full menu of discussion around diabetes and the control of diabetes and what diabetes is. And this hopefully would have provided uh, information and recommendations to those who are listening. So this segment, uh, as I understand it, is a question and answer segment. Yes. Is that, uh, am I the one who are, who's no. managing that? Well, okay, so. Yes. Okay, so I want to ask persons on Zoom if there are any questions that you uh, want to ask or any follow-up. Just use your raise and feature. We have Stephen who is managing that process and he will recognize you for any comments. Anyone? Stephen? Okay, so let me, let me raise one uh, and, and, and because I... I'm no expert, so I depend on the experts, and I, I don't always have all of you in the room at the same time. I like to have a drink now and then, and I'll go no further than that. How is that? And many people, many of us in Jamaica, in keeping with the festive culture, don't mind having a drink now and then. And I see the cameramen and the <laughs> operators shaking their heads, you know, in agreement. So I know I'm asking the question on their behalf also. Um, some of us do it because it offers a little stress relief after a long day. Some of us do it because it's a little, it goes well with friends and liming, if you want to call it that. Uh, um, as it relates to drinking and diabetes, how much of a risk is it? How much should you have? And if you actually have diabetes, I've had a debate with some people um, who tell me that, boy, you know, drink vodka instead of rum or drink this instead of that. So I don't know if it's a nutritionist going to advise me on this or somebody else, but jump in whoever you are and tell me to drink or not to drink. And I'm talking about the spirits now as it relates to diabetes. So we will direct that question to our nutritionist, um, Ms. Sabrina Palomino. Are you there? Hello, are you yes. hearing me? Yes, we are hearing you. Please go ahead. Okay. You, you heard the question? <laughs> yes, I did. Oh, okay. 
Right, so we uh, a very good question, Dr. Tufton. With diabetes, the, with consultation with your doctor and your nutritionist, your dietitian, it is usually uh, recommendations for persons living with diabetes is that for women, it's usually you can have a drink per day and for men is no more than two drink. And what is a drink? Usually for beer, it's not more than 12 ounces. And for like a shot, it's usually a shot, which is about one and a half ounces. And for wine, recommendation is usually about five ounces thereabout. What we do recommend is that alcohol, when you're having alcohol as a person living with diabetes, is not to have it on an empty stomach because, you know, it gives the risk of lowering your blood sugar. And also what we want you to do is that once you have diabetes, we do not really recommend the mixed drinks, so as to say, because they usually have a sweetened base. So, you know, like the, what you would call them, the hummingbird or any one of those blended juice that usually have a very high sugar content or sugar base. Hope that answers your question. Not really. Um, sorry to stick on the issue, but um, I don't have a drinking problem, but I do have a drink now and then, as all of us in this room do. Um, yes. the, the type of drink, though, because there is the cane-based drink, which is the Appleton and the rum and so on. Then you have the vodka, which is potato-based, I'm told. I mean, is there any particular type? I mean, it's, it's still concentrated it's usually, sugar. Either, either way, it's usually one and a half ounce of those. So it's usually a shot. A shot. Of whether it's your vodka or your rum. So that's, yes. that's way before you start feeling mellow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, it's important to know. Um, it's important to know in a culture where many of us are um, prone to having a shot now and then. And then the that's other true. question I'd like to ask, if, if I, and I'm not sure who, is um, the the difference between pre-diabetic and being diabetic. I think that's an important, there are some definitions there that are required. What, what, what does pre-diabetic or pre-diabetes mean in terms of danger, danger zone or how do you pull back from that, that, that type of thing? What is that? Okay. What? All right, so um, Nurse Hunt, you are on still are you still there we also i'm not certain if she's still I'm there hearing, i'm okay. hearing you all right yeah yes that's a great question dr tufton the person who has pre-diabetes has blood sugar levels that are mildly elevated and we actually have criteria for that and that was one of the slides i had and the A1C is usually between 5.7 to 6.4. Their bl fasting blood sugar is 100, which is about five millimoles, but it's less than the seven, which is the cutoff for diabetes. A person with prediabetes can make a change in their lifestyle mm -hmm. and she lose a little weight, join an exercise program, walk, and they have shown that the diabetes prevention program has shown that this can stop the progression to diabetes. So pre-diabetes is very important and 12% of the population have pre-diabetes. So you would want that 12% to be identified and to be engaged in a program to prevent the progression to diabetes. Excellent question. Thank you for that. Any question? Um... I think Bishop, Bishop Forbes has a question. All right, you can go ahead, Bishop Forbes, with your question. Yes, morning again. With morning. the level of diabetes or diabetic um, person in Jamaica, could it be possible that um, when we get um, prescription for argument sake, take it to any pharmacist in the country and get it supplied or could the ministry put something in place because of the amount of persons to go to one particular um, institution is kind of difficult. Could something be put in place to assist all the patients with um, prescriptions to go to any pharmacist to get their prescription filled? Well, let me answer that because that's a policy, policy position. Um, the truth is that the 
National Health Fund has several drug serve windows across the country. I believe during my tenure over the previous four years, we had added a significant number of public-private partnerships, so private pharmacies that are equipped with a drug serve window. And chances are, outside of the clinic that you attend, there are several other drug serve windows in and around your vicinity, in the town center and otherwise, that could administer a prescription that you get from the public health system. So I believe with the last count, I don't say, um, I'm trying to recall, would be somewhere in the region of 100, plus, maybe 150 such facilities across the country. Um, and we have expanded the network in order to offer greater access while still maintaining control of how, how the, 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 the service is provided. The challenge with making it any entity is the management of that process and uh, you know the drugs are very expensive and if you don't have a handle on it it does leave the system up to abuse so the answer to your question is um, we understand the need for more access which is why we have put in more locations you probably should ask your uh, health center where are the other locations in that vicinity, uh, whether in the town or the, the capital or, or elsewhere, and then allow yourself to exercise the option to go to any of those. But to make it every, any pharmacy whatsoever would pose a challenge and would require a level of monitoring and infrastructure that I don't think is affordable at this particular point in time. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, and thank you very much, uh, Bishop Ford, for that question. I understand that we have another question from uh, Prof. Morrison. Yeah. Hello. I have been challenged with the technology, <laughs> and I wanted to come in a little earlier uh, on the matter of alcohol, because like Minister, I share a little interest there <laughs> and a proclivity to the odd drink. But look, I just wanted you know, to remind us all of one or two cultural problems we have there and then to speak specifically about the alcohol. Because there is a belief, you know, that if you are to drink white rum, it burns up the sugar and so helps the diabetes. That could not be farther from the truth. And I thought I just wanted to put that in, in place that it is folklore, which is totally, you know, uh, out of line. The other matter now is alcohol is alcohol, irrespective of its source, whether it be cane, grapes, potato, yam, whatever. It is all alcohol. And when alcohol is taken in, it contributes into the energy process. So by doing so, it reduces the use of glucose and so it helps to elevate blood sugar levels. So alcohol taken in excess is always a problem. A small amount of alcohol, however, is certainly stimulatory and can help a mild blood vessel relaxation and allow for lowering of blood pressure. But, you know, I just thought I would just put the whole thing in context that alcohol in and of itself in small amounts Nothing is wrong, especially, you know, uh, when I emphasize small amounts. But where the folklore is and where a lot of people still believe in it, you know, I hear it daily, this white from business curing the sugar. And I think we need to really stress that kind of misinformation out there. I trust I might have contributed a little there. Thank you so much. Club soda and lime a lot more popular now as a, as a result <laughs> of that COVID. Thank you. Thank you, okay. Prof. Yes. Thank you so much, um, Prof, for that contribution. Very, very important, you know, in dispelling that myth. Um, are there oh. any? Oh, Minister, you are saying? Final question, and I, I have to go after uh, okay. shortly, so I, okay. unless you have others. But the, this idea, Madam Plummer, of physical activity, I, I am, I am, I've been coming to terms with this concept of, 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 of mindfulness, which is now a buzz term around relaxation and 
I guess this applies to you too, Dr. Goldburn, which is how do you get into a space where the stress level is managed through, you know, relaxation and meditation and, and so on. Um, you know, I, 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 how, much of, how much of that is even listening to motivational talks, how much of that is a big player in just sort of managing the, 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 the levels of stress which is linked to blood sugar levels and so on? Is it, is it both of you could comment on that, maybe starting with you, Dr. Goldburn? Yes, thank you, Mr. Bell, the important observation. And yes, it's very important that one have periods of relaxation. I may be taking different forms, maybe listening to music, it may be just quiet time, maybe um, watching a movie. It's very important because that will break the stress level that is on your mind, which affects your glucose control, it affects how you feel, and it will contribute towards you having poor control of your blood sugar. And poor control of blood sugar will also have other negative impact. So it's very important that, especially in this time and other times, is to control the stress. Because what I want to emphasize is doing what you can do to control your where your body is some things are external to you but you can control your emotional state one thing also I encourage a person to do is actually what we call breathing relaxation exercises the simple exercise can be done for about 10 minutes especially before going to sleep and in the morning just to relax your mind and your body before you start a hard day and before you go off to sleep to turn off your engine as it were so you can have a good and restful sleep with pleasant dreams or no dreams at all like good dreams. Uh, um, but I, I'm reading a book now, Miss Plummer, by the name of um, The Joy of Movement. And, and it, it's, it's quite interesting because the, the studies, this is a, the author is a, is a researcher, the studies show that movement actually creates contentment, happiness. It, it really stimulates I'm not a clinician, but it stimulates the enzymes that promotes a level of, of positive feeling. And I wondered, you know, if you wanted to comment on that and emphasize that, because um, sometimes when we approach exercise as a chore, because we think we have to do it, you, it's count, it becomes counterproductive. The question is, how do you get persons to get into exercising in a way that they look forward to it? and reap the maximum benefits from it and, 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 and simple things. So what's your thought on that maybe uh, to encourage others? There are several researches that have shown that physical activity, when done properly, it helps to produce what we call a feel-good endorphins in the body that allows us to feel good, make you, you know, want to feel more relaxed. It also helps to strengthen the muscles. And for persons who are diabetic, again, you heard it, allows you to use up glucose and so once you're exercising it is going to be of benefit to the body what we want persons to understand is that you want to start out slowly and gradually increase one of the things that we are finding oh, you used to be in PE class is like it's almost as was a punishment that you just go do five laps and you're not inclined to physical activity and so you know you feel a little awkward people are laughing at you and it's kind of difficult but if you start out slowly the muscle get used to it and becomes a natural part of your routine, you'll be surprised. The muscle start getting stronger and stronger, you start feeling better. And then one of the biggest thing is to do something that you love. Because if you're doing something that you love, Jamaicans love to dance. As you put in a little music, everybody wants to rock to the beat. Mm -hmm. So you might want to start out with that, even if you're going to church, you know, too many of us are just sitting down now, it's just in our bones, to so just move to the beat. So you do something that you love, do it consistently, and we don't want you to overwork the muscle because what happens when you overwork your muscles, you start feeling excess pain, and then you say, boy, it's too difficult, and I don't want to do it. So it is really, really important that you start out slow, do something that you love, and look at the short-term benefits. When you finish, your muscles feel relaxed. You feel you, you can increase your oxygen going to the brain to make you even concentrate better. So those are some short-term benefits. And then you look at the intermediate, you might say, boy, I start losing some weight, and then you start seeing the muscles start getting stronger and stronger, and it becomes a lifestyle. And so you see all that benefit, and you make it a daily routine. Don't sit down for too long. If you see like now with the COVID, you feel that you're sitting down around the computer, just get up and start moving. Make that circulation, go about and you start feeling better. But when you do sitting down, you're working, 
feel body get up and you stretch out. Ah, feel so good and you're energetic again and you want to go. I feel like I want to go exercise right now. Yes. All right, so thank you very much. I'm going to hand over now to... Thank you for ably managing this segment of the discussion. We really do appreciate that. Uh, we have heard the testimonials. We have heard from our experts in the field. And um, I am sure you would agree that this was really a very informative, they were very informative presentations. And I want to thank them. But we do have somebody who is going to formally give the vote of thanks. And so I will now call on Mrs. Shirley Hibbert, our former Deputy Chief Nurse, to move the vote of thanks for us. Thank you, Madam Chair. Allow me to acknowledge Honorable Minister of Health, or Christopher Tufton, Dr. The Honorable Christopher Tufton, Professor Morrison, the president of the Jamaica Diabetes Association of Jamaica, other esteemed panelists, other persons in the audience, and all of us in online who have been watching and listening. Thank you so much for sharing this time with us. I'm sure you'd agree with me. Are you hearing me properly? I'm sure you'd agree with me that this has been an inspiring, highly educational session as we celebrate the start of Diabetes Month. Thank you for your keen attention, both to those here as well as to you online. We want to thank our own esteemed director, ex nurse director extraordinaire, Angela Thomas, for having acknowledged God's presence. We thank our professor, Aaron Morrison. He is an expert in the field of diabetes. Thank you, sir, for having shared with us. You have taught me something new, the white coat syndrome. I didn't know about that, sir. Thank you for sharing with us. Minister of Health, you are really, as Professor said, everywhere doing that which is necessary for the health of the nation. We thank you, Lord. Um, we thank you, sir, for being here with us. You have outlined the scale of the problem, and you also said that you are here, along with the rest of us, to champion the cause as it relates to diabetes. We want to ensure the best possible outcomes for our people and with nurses, doctors, and other health workers, surely this will be done. We want to thank Bishop Solomon Forbes. What a compelling commentary of his health journey. Thank you, sir. I'm sure that what you have said will help some persons in their journey also. All right, Nurse Andrea Hunt. We thank you to, for having helped us to better understand diabetes and uh, how to manage ourselves if we do have it. We take note of the targets, guidelines, and of course, most importantly, prevention of this disease, ensuring that we do our foot care and we work as a team in caring for ourselves. Ms. Palomino, the diabetic diet does not exist. We have heard and we will surely follow that with balanced meals done in a, or taken in timely manner. Ms. Plummer, thank you so much for having shared with us. We will swim, we will jog, we will dance. And of course, we'll also check with our doctor in, to ensure that we are following the right prescription. So we understand, yes, more movements, more moments, more life. Dr. Goldburn. Thank you for sharing with us, sir, um, during these depressing times of life for those who have diabetes. You have shared some good coping tips, and so we will definitely seek out credible information. We will socialize, we'll keep well, and of course, we'll utilize that helpline, 888-NEW-LIFE. Thank you, Madam Moderator, our own Chief Nurse, for having ably taken us through this session. Thank you so very much. You have done excellent. 
And so it leaves just for me to thank all other stakeholders. Media, thank you for being here and for sharing in this time with us. Thank you for all those who are online. Thank you for our nurse leaders in the audience with us and watching also on, on screen. Thank you all for a time well spent as we reflect on diabetes and how we must prevent it. Thank you all. Thank you so much, um, Mrs. Shirley Hibbert. Um, you know, and so there you have it. I do believe that this was indeed an excellent session. And I do hope that your awareness of diabetes and its management have increased as we work, as we work as a team in preventing diabetes and assisting persons living with diabetes to maintain good health. Remember to look out for our other activities as we, as we uh, celebrate this month of diabetes, um, this month, Diabetes Month. I wish for you God's continued blessings. Three factors can help you make safe choices when you're in an area of widespread COVID-19 transmission. Consider the location, the proximity to others, and the amount of time you spend there. Where does your activity take place? Open air spaces are always safer than enclosed spaces, particularly if they're small or without fresh air. Proximity to other people is also important. It's safest when there are fewer people around and you can keep more than one meter apart. How long does your activity last? The shorter, the better. Think about each of these factors and avoid situations where the risk dial is high. Small or poorly ventilated places and crowds of people for long periods of time. Stay safe, lower the risk to yourself and others. Jamaica's heartland. As you can see, it's a farming community, very deep rural. And if the company should come now and mine these lands, then the livelihood of the people would be at stake. Home to many Jamaicans who love where they live and want to make sure it is protected. One of my major concerns is the water stem from Ultrius right back to Montego Bay. All of these water come from the cockpit company. When the bauxite company mine these places and chubble the water stable, what are we going to do? They're having uh, the problem with the water in the city, in the school. The, the top of the school, which we use as the main source of catching the water, the catchment for the town. And then when they dust, um, come out there, then they wash into